Tony Birch is an Australian novelist and poet. His works include Ghost River, The White Girl and Blood, which was shortlisted for the prestigious Mulls Franklin Award. Tony Birch talks now with Professor Jing Han from the Institute for Australian and Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. The Foundation for Australian Studies in China acknowledges the traditional owners of the unceded land on which this interview was conducted. Hello, Tony. Hello, how are you, Jing? So happy to have you here, and it's such an honour to have you with us today. There is a Chinese saying, 文如其人, meaning one's writing reviews and reflects one's character and personality. Having read all your books, I can see a lot of you through your stories. And your writing also reflects and is informed by your life experiences. But your experiences and the environment you grew up in are not just a personal, but also an integral part of the colonial and post-colonial history of Australian and Indigenous people, like a piece to the jigsaw puzzle. You didn't grow up in a rural, remote area of Australia, but in a suburb of Melbourne called Fitzroy. These days, many people know Fitzroy as a trendy and arty place. Can you tell us your family background and what it was like growing up in Fitzroy? Yes, so um, I grew up in Fitzroy, which is a Melbourne inner suburb. Um, we moved there in the late 1950s when I was just a baby. But my father's family, who are basically an Aboriginal and um, Barbadian family, that is, he's a direct um, descendant of a man, Prince Moody, who had been transported from Barbados to Van Diemen's Land, or what we call Tasmania today, in the mid-19th century. Both my grandparents on my father's side of the family and my mother's side of the family lived in Fitzroy, so we had many households of um, aunties and uncles and cousins and grandparents living in a very close area. The suburb was a very um, important suburb for Aboriginal people moving to Melbourne, particularly during the Second World War, where a lot of Aboriginal people moved from rural parts of Victoria to the cities to find work. So there was a lot of work in the cities um, during the Second World War, and they stayed in the inner city. The other issue that's really important about Fitzroy and my writing is that it was always a very strong multicultural suburb so that not only was there a very strong white working class um, population, as I said, there was a relatively large Aboriginal population, but also a lot of migrants who moved to the suburb after the Second World War, particularly Greeks and Italians, but also other nationalities from Europe. So I grew up in a suburb that really I was very lucky to mix with people from all over the world from a young age, and I think that had a really positive impact on my upbringing and the way that I understand the world. Um, the other thing is um, the original and Torres Strait Island people were not even considered members of Australian population, which many people didn't realise, uh, until the 1967 referendum, which for the first time, included original owners of the continent in the census. So did growing up as an Aboriginal of a mixed race, which you mentioned just before, yeah. subject you to bullying and discrimination? And did the 1967 referendum bring any changes to your life? It's a very, it's a very important question, Jing, but a very complex question because you, you are right that in 1967 there was a referendum held across the country which gave the Commonwealth, that successful referendum, gave the Commonwealth the power to count Aboriginal people in the census, which also gave the Commonwealth power to then introduce um, monetary um, pieces of legislation to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Some people mistakenly refer to the 1967 referendum as a referendum for the vote. That, in fact, is not correct because the complexity of Aboriginal identity is such that there were some Aboriginal people across Australia who could not vote in an election until 1967, 
and yet there were Aboriginal people living in other parts of the country who actually voted in the first election in 1901. And what I mean by that, if you're an Aboriginal person living in Victoria, so Victoria becomes an independent colony in 1851 and then a state of the Commonwealth in 1901 with Federation, legislation would have been introduced many times over that period that would have changed your legal identity. So an Aboriginal person could and was classified as an Aboriginal person. They could be reclassified as a mixed blood person and they could be then reclassified as a white person. There is no simple answer to that question except to say that our lives were subject to very invasive forms of legislation throughout the 20th century. In my particular sense, I'd say, no, I, as a child and as a teenager, I didn't feel that I, I, I didn't suffer any, sorry, any discrimination at home or around Fitzroy because, to be honest, my, my father had a very good reputation. My family had a good reputation and people either respected our family or, or knew that we were very strong and independent. I think what happens to kids of my generation it was more the discrimination you faced in the schoolyard, um, sometimes in the workplace, where people who would really be in situations of great dominance. So often, you know, you could go to a school room and be the only Aboriginal kid in the classroom. Um, one interesting thing I note, you were, you were expelled from school twice and you didn't finish high school. But several years later, you went back to complete your high school certificate. And in 1988, at the age of 30, you enrolled in the uh, University of Melbourne as a mature student. How did you then become a writer? And why did you want to be a writer? I was expelled from two high schools in Melbourne in the one year, which is not easy to do. And um, I... I had fairly menial jobs for a period after I left school and then I was lucky or fortunate to get a job in the fire brigade. I was a firefighter in Melbourne for, for around 10 years. And the connection that kept me interested in education was reading, which, of course, is the same connection that led to me wanting to be a writer. So I'd always been a very good reader at school, if, if nothing else. When I initially went to university, I, my main interest was in doing history and I completed a history degree. I did honours in history and I did my PhD in history and my first full-time academic position was in history. I think the issue around wanting to be a writer was that even when I did what you might call academic history essays, I always turned it into a story. I was much more interested in the storytelling aspect of a narrative as a teacher I'm more interested in the, you know, communicating ideas and I found that I enjoyed doing that teaching writing as much as I did teaching history but on a personal level I think over the years I've just become much more interested in examining or engaging you know, with the human condition of relationships between people relationships between individuals and society through fiction and I think that, you know, why I became a writer in a much more formal sense is that I think I use fiction as a means of trying to, to explain or come to terms with the world and also to convey how I see the world, my worldview, which essentially in a country like Australia, which is regarded, you know, as a, as a democratic free society and a relatively quite a wealthy society, I actually see that many people in Australia are, are pushed to the margins of society, not only Aboriginal people, but generally poorer people. And I'm interested in those type of characters and I'm interested in, in writing about them in a way that gives them value. Your first book, Shadow Boxing, a collection of short stories, has been reprinted nine times since its first publication. Uh, the stories were set in Fitzroy in the 1960s, following a tough life journey of a boy called Michael Burr. Poverty, violence, tension, and a bare survival were tangible throughout the book. You said that uh, these stories are autobiographical in a much more psychological way than in a realist way. The characters in your short stories are often not specifically identified as Aboriginal. In Shadow Boxing, the main character, Michael's identity, 
it's only hinted at in the story, the bulldozer, mm -hmm. in which a demolition worker asked Michael, what are your kids? An abu, meaning Aboriginal, an Indian, or a ho no hopa. What are you? A bit of a each, maybe? Is this blurring out a racial or indeterminate identification intentional on your part? Is that oh, because... Sorry, go on. Yeah, is that because you didn't want those stories to be typecast as Aboriginal stories only? That's true. So there are two main reasons. One is that if we think of Michael as a character and think again, I talked earlier about Fitzroy being a very multicultural suburb. I wanted to be sure that if, if the kids that I grew up amongst read that book, that they could equally identify with Michael if they're Aboriginal or not. So if, you know, one of my friends, my childhood friends who might be Greek or Italian or, yeah, poor white kid, I would hope that they could recognise something central about themselves or their upbringing in Michael. So that, that was um, clearly intentional. The other thing, though, is it was in part to represent the the um, the you know, the cultural and biological makeup of who I am. So that, um, as I said before, um, you know, we have um, a strong Aboriginal culture in our family. We have um, we're all direct descendants from a man called Prince, Prince Moody from Barbados. Um, but in my family, I have Maltese cousins. I have cousins who are uh, direct descendants of my great-grandfather by marriage, a man called Bhutta Khan, who came from the Punjab in 1890 to the colony of Victoria. So in my extended family, so many different cultures and ethnicities are represented. And some of us, we share that biologically or we share it culturally. So my sense there was that Michael is a boy who, who he's not, clearly not ideally white. We know he's not white. But he is he is all of those mixes, or he represents all of those mixtures. I want to make sure that people remember that these families were families of great diversity because you know, people often think about multiculturalism in Australia as being a you know, a sort of a post-80s phenomenon, or certainly as an official policy um, enacted from the early 1980s and what I would say well we were practicing multiculturalism long before that and Australia has always been a much more multicultural country than people understand and yet for your for your interest here um, we know that you know people may not know that in the 1850s 20 percent of people who were on the goldfields were from China 20 percent of people making their way across Victoria to the goldfields had come from China and they stayed in Victoria. So the Australian Chinese diaspora is incredibly rich and many people don't understand that. So when people think of Chinese as foreigners, it's, it's a ludicrous proposition because Australian Chinese have such an important um, history in this country. Um, and in the story, The Butcher's Wife, which is about domestic violence, which leads to a murder, the violence that the butcher's wife is subjected to is rendered in chilling and the clinical details. What is more impactful on readers is Michael's constant references to his own mother suffering violence from his father. For example, Michael said, I would often wake during the night to the cries of the butcher's wife. I was never sure at first if the noise was coming from across the street or from my own house. Does the title The Butcher's Wife have any reference to Henry Lawson's famous story, The Jover's Wife? And the main question is, violence is one of the recurrent themes in your stories and novels. Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, so in regard to the reference to The Jover's Wife, there's certainly no um, overlay in regard to that story. I, did, I was aware of The Jover's Wife being a title that I wanted to, to play off. So, yeah, The Butcher's Wife, thinking of it, I did think of the Lawson story, but not, not the content of the story, if, if that makes sense. In regard to the violence, both in that book, particularly domestic violence and, and violence in my work overall, the real issue of, of violence in shadow boxing is around the hypocrisy of masculinity so that a lot of the male characters espouse and are quite tough men, and they are men who 
who are quite proud of their their toughness and and their their ability to assert themselves. And what Michael is witness to, he's witness to the the terrible hypocrisy of that. That these very strong men, in fact, are bullies. They assault women. They they which makes them both bullies and cowards in his eyes. So that's specific to to the book. In a more general sense, Jing, I I think that one of the issues we understand in recent years is that um, there has been a strong campaign globally by women to make sure that domestic violence is an issue that is confronted and spoken about and addressed. When I wrote Shadow Boxing, um, we were still dealing with great secrecy, and we still are in some ways, of course, dealing with great secrecy, so that the way that I grew up is that while people would be aware that um, violence against women was relatively common um, where I lived, no one ever spoke openly about it. So, you know, in a way, what I want to do in that sense with my writing is to expose this secret again through, through strong um, storytelling. The issue that becomes, I suppose, an issue of responsibility for me is that I am writing about domestic violence in Aboriginal and working class communities. The the problem with that is that for some people that will simply fulfil a stereotype. Yes, violence against women occurs in Aboriginal families and it occurs in poor families. We know that's not true. We know that domestic violence um, knows no class and we know that domestic violence occurs in all different classes and ethnicities in Australia and I'm sure globally. Because your short stories are both riveting and haunting and that's why people keep coming back to read them and I keep reading them. I found them a heart-wrenching, heartbreaking, but also heartwarming. This mind-gripping effect on the reader often comes from a sudden turn of event and this sudden turn of event is a cra- it's a, it's a couched in your craftily selected deta- details. For example, in the story, Redemption, Michael's hardened and violent father showed no remorse. But when he asked Michael to take him to the cemetery to find his own mother's grave, he told Michael that he had slept in his mom's bed till he was 12 when she died uh, because they lived in an overcrowded place. He went on to say, couldn't believe she was dead, even when the doctor covered her body over. So I jumped in the bed with her and wouldn't let go, hung on to her body. That's incredibly touching and moving, just nothing else needs to be said. So how do you decide what details to choose and include that make all the difference? Um, Well, I think there are two things, um, Jing. One is that most of my stories would, in fact, begin with what we might call that sort of seed, that moment or that that pause, a a portrait, a still portrait that you know is pivotal to whatever else happens in the story. So often I will I will begin with an image like that, which I know this is this is the key to the story. How then do I build the narrative around that? So th- that's the way that my short stories often work. I'm very much interested in what I might call nonverbal language, so that a lot of those moments in my work, they they may be accompanied by speech, but it's often about physicality and it's about physical touch. And again, I think that people who enjoy my work as a body of work understand that while if you go back to a story like The Butcher's Wife or a story like The Lesson in um, Shadow Boxing, which is about boxing, they are quite visceral, quite violent stories. Many of my stories the physical touch is very subtle, very nuanced, and I think very tender. So I use physicality between characters as a way of telling a story. Uh, no wonder you are called by critics a master of short stories with a profound gift for language and human insight. Your stories about common people, which you mentioned, often the marginalised, the outsiders, the disadvantaged and the vulnerable. Uh, deep down in your stories, uh, no matter how relentless and uh, tough they are, there is always this humanitarian touch and an optimism in human nature. Your stories speak to readers on multiple, multiple levels. When I realised that the three stories, 
Afterlife, Bicycle Thieves and Lemonade in your latest book, Dark as Last Night. Where about your younger brother who died under very sad circumstances? I've reread the stories and the impact certainly deepened on a more personable level. In Lemonade, the way you particularized the sense of guilt and punishment through a seemingly minor incident in which the narrator was carried away by his own joy and forgot his younger brother to bring his younger brother a can of lemonade um, after the brother had waited for him sweating the thirst under the scorching sun. It's really haunting. But in an interesting and a surprising way, the lemonade incident, minor as it is, has acquired a, a highly symbolic status. I could never, ever forget that story after the that story, Lemonade. Lemonade has a different meaning to me now. How do you find the materials for your stories? And uh, um, I mean, let's, let's think about that particular story. It was that I did... The, I did the the truth in that story or the aspect of the story that's based on fact is that I did feel very guilty for many years for a similar mi minor incident of my younger brother wanting me to take him to play with my older friends and I didn't want to take him, so I told him a lie. And he didn't even remember this many years later, but I never forgot it. So when I think about that incident and how to place it into a story, what I had to think about, Jing, was a way of making that story, the depth of guilt be real because many people, if I told people, look, I've harboured this guilt all my life because I left my younger brother sitting on the step, people would sort of shrug their shoulders and say, get over it, you know. So I had to think about how I would craft a story like that. You, you start to think about there's a challenge here because you have to convince your reader. It's what I call authenticity and plausibility. The story has to be plausible for the reader. The story has to be written in the way that the reader goes, I understand that. I accept that. I understand why the character would feel this way. So when I'm beginning a story, they're, they're the sorts of questions. Is this story plausible? Is this story authentic to itself? And I always used to say to my students, whether we write autobiographically or not, writing is a craft. It's a technology of communication. The truth of the story is irrelevant if you don't craft it well. Be sure to watch part two of our conversation with Tony Birch or browse through our entire collection of interviews with Australian authors.